everyone. Welcome to our, our webinar, today's webinar on energy efficiency in smart buildings to IoT sensor integration. We are very honored to have uh, you and honored to have our respected speaker with us, Professor Dr. Saifur Rahman, sir. Uh, we don't need, uh, we actually don't need much of an introduction for him because everybody knows him, but uh, it is our honor to introduce him to the audience. Uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Saifur Rahman, sir, he's a life fellow of IEEE. He's the Joseph Loring Professor and di di Director of the Virginia Tech Advanced Research Institute of USA. And he is the president of IEEE Power and Energy Society in 2018 and 2019. Professor Saifur Rahman is the founding director of the Advanced Research Institute at Virginia Tech USA, where he is the Joseph R. Loring Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He also directs the Center for Energy and Global Environment. He's a life fellow of the IEEE and an IEEE Millennium Medal winner. He was the president of the IEEE Power and Energy Society, that is PES, for 2018 and 2019. He was the founding editor in chief of the IEEE Electrification Magazine and the IEEE Transaction on Sustainable Energy. He has published over 140 journal papers and has made over 400 conference and invited presentations. In 2006, he served on the IEEE Board of Directors as the vice president for publications. He's a distinguished lecturer for the IEEE Power and Energy Society and has lectured on renewable energy, energy efficiency, smart grid, energy internet, blockchain, ID sensor integration, etc. in over 30 countries. He's the founder of BEM Controls LLC, a Virginia, Virginia USA-based software company providing building energy management solutions. He served as the chair of the US National Science Foundation Advisory Committee for International Science and Engineering from 2010 to 2013. He has conducted several energy efficiency, blockchain and sensor integration projects for Duke Energy, Tokyo Electric Power Company, the US National Science Foundation, the US Department of Defense, the US Department of Energy, and the state of Virginia. He has a PhD in electrical engineering from Virginia Tech. We are very pleased and honored to have you, sir. And uh, I'd like to take a moment to introduce uh, our today's moderator of the session, Dr. Shaikh Patta, sir. Uh, he's a professor at the Department of Tripoli Buet. He's the chair of the Education Committee, IEEE Humanitarian Activity Committee. He's the chair of IEEE SSIT Bangladesh chapter, and he's the advisor of IEEE PES, Buet SD chapter. So thank you, sir. Uh, with your permission, uh, uh, I ask you to start the webinar. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Let me, let me go to my screen. Hold on a second. Yes, sir. Can you see my full screen, Satyaki? Yes. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. You can see it. Well, good evening, everybody. I appreciate this opportunity to come before you and talk about one of my research topics. But the most impressive thing is that I was looking at the chat box. I see Sri Lanka, I see Gorakhpur, I see Ukraine, I see Japan, I see Taiwan, I see Indonesia. I've been to all those countries, by the way, except Ukraine so far. So I'm happy that you are here. So again, if I focus on the title of my talk, the three elements I'm going to focus on. One is energy efficiency. Second, smart buildings. Third, IoT sensors. I'll, I'll show you how I put all that together to make a building smart. That's the focus. Now, if I can move on then, this is the data from US. Very interesting set of numbers. In US, buildings as a whole, all kinds of buildings, commercial buildings, school, office, shopping center, homes, they are the biggest single source of energy used in the US. Biggest source, 40%. All energy goes to buildings. That's heating, cooling, lighting, all of that. Elevators, all of that, big number. You'll be surprised to know buildings in the US are not all very big. 90% of buildings are small, meaning between zero and 50,000 square feet. 50,000 square feet is not a big building, 90%. Because these buildings are small, they cannot afford to spend half a million dollars to put a building automation system. It's too much money for them. So they don't. As a result, buildings go 
not automated in terms of air conditioning, heating, lighting load and the like. That was my research. I did that research, I developed a product platform called Wise Building at the bottom of the screen, Wise BLDG, which can make a building smart and run automatically from uh, program and remote locations. That's the objective. Now, if you look at the chart here, what is the focus? I said we have developed the yellow writing at the top, developed an open architecture platform for building energy efficiency. Keyword is open architecture. That means you can add many things as you go forward. We started with heating, ventilation and AC, plus lighting load, plug load. We've added solar, rooftop solar, added security camera, we've added the battery storage in that building. So that is the beauty of our work. It's open architecture, you start with something and build around it as your demands grow. What is the net output? The blue box at the bottom. Because of this application, we can make the building more energy efficient, meaning you use less energy to run the building on a typical day. And because we can manage the load more efficiently, we can reduce the peak load for the building. This is a big challenge in Bangladesh, India, many countries. Peak is very expensive to manage, but if we can reduce the peak, I'll give an example in a few minutes. If you reduce the peak, we do not put extra stress on the power system. So that's the idea. And how we did that, if you look at the orange color box on the upper left, we have put IoT enabled equipment in these buildings. What is an IoT enabled equipment? You all know about thermostats, air conditioning, thermostat on the wall that looks at the building room temperature and set point. Based on that, it decides to or not to, uh, to, or not to turn on the AC and how long the AC should run. That's an IoT device because it is a device which is smart thermostat on the internet and it's telling you the status and you can send control signals, fan on, heating on, cooling on, uh, duration of the, how long the heating goes on, all of that is done through the thermostat. That's an example. Okay, now, this is my lab. I took one floor in this building, that is a building on the left, and put these IoT devices in that building on that floor. What are the devices I put in? Again, it's a test case. Not typically you would not put all of them in a, in a building, but depending on what your application is, you'll put some of them. So on the upper left-hand side, I'm showing different kinds of thermostats. Interestingly, you have to be watching not only that hardware, how does it run? What is the protocol? Some Wi-Fi thermostat, some Zigbee thermostat, something like this, thermostats. Then I have, if you followed from the upper left-hand side, go counterclockwise, then VAV controller, variable aperture volume controller for airflow, for air conditioning, number one. Number two, rooftop unit RTU. Again, see the mod bus, another protocol. I have Philip Hue lighting light bulbs, Wi-Fi, light switch, lighting load controller, uh, dim ballast, smart plug, different kinds, uh, building plug load controller again, occupancy sensor, light sensor, smart power meters. We put all of that to test how we can save energy and run the building with less peak power. The box in the middle, the kind of grayish white color plastic box, this box contains a Raspberry Pi, as simple as that. That Raspberry Pi has enough memory and CPU capacity to monitor data from these devices and based on the algorithm what it wants to do, sends control signals. That's how we started. Now, before I go too far, let me show you this page, the very important. As I said here, BACnet, Modbus, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, different kinds of uh, protocols. We are a university, we do not make any hardware. So we have no choice about the protocol. So we just buy what we get. Our biggest challenge for the research was this. I'm getting different technologies for communicating, Ethernet, Serial, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, data exchange protocols. I have, for example, BACnet, Modbus, Web, 
smart energy profile, open it here, all that is my reality. Our main contribution was we were able to build translators. We don't care what language we speak from the hardware side. We will translate that to literally Wi-Fi in our case. And then this box, these, the Raspberry Pi, receives Wi-Fi signals. That's the focus of our research. That's how we are able to very open in the sense of we don't need to watch out that I can only accept ZigBee device or Wi-Fi device. It doesn't matter. You can give me any device. If I know the API for the device, I can control it. That's the idea. Good. Now, that was one building, one floor. Now, typical like Buyard campus, there's many buildings. So we decided that rather than put a per floor, put one Raspberry Pi, we go to the cloud now. Because it is very common these days to have internet in the building, very common all over the world, literally. So we said, fine, why worry about in the building device, which can break down, can be, uh, can be taken out of service. So we just, we just forgot that. Now, everything we do, we can still do Raspberry Pi, but we prefer to put things in the cloud. That way we can avoid one point of failure. Raspberry Pi or a microcomputer can fail any time, then you are stuck. Sometimes you used to port a backup computer also. Those are possibilities. Anyway, what happens here, a university campus, many buildings, each building has an account in the cloud, in this our case, AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services cloud. Each building has an account. So that building is managed from that account. What do you mean manage means that account queries the building every few minutes, looks at the current status of voltage, power, and many other things, and sends a control signal. Fine. Now in any campus, there will be a central control office, which will look at the status of every building, their heating, cooling, ventilation, temperature setting, all of that. That's why I have, if you follow the cloud picture in the middle of this page, on the upper side, I have a central controller which is talking to all these boxes. Each box manages a building. That's the setup. In addition, on the upper left-hand side, I have a, this purple box, which is showing that we are also connected to the power company's data because we need to know whether, if and whether, the power pricing is changing. It happens in the US. Peak hour price changes. That information comes in to the central controller. The control box is all pre-programmed. Based on the price signal, they can control the AC temperature setting, ventilation and the like. Then other thing I'm showing here on the lower right-hand side, what equipment we are controlling and monitoring from this platform. Heating and air conditioning, we know that. Lighting loads, plug loads, sensors and power meters, water meters, rooftop PV and storage, and security camera. This is the point. I started with building automation, heating, cooling, and lighting, that's it. I've added uh, water meter, uh, power meters, rooftop solar, storage battery. The point is because I have an open architecture platform, I can add things as needed. This is the beauty of this work that nobody has done that I know of. Okay, now, because of this, availability of flexible options, I can claim our platform, a wise building platform, can make any old building smart. The reason is when you build a smart building, you provide the SCADA communication wiring required to sense information from all corners of the building and take some control action. This is normally done. But since buildings are old, in our case, in the US, 90% or more buildings are more than 10 years old. More than 90%, 10 years old. So what do you do? I said, oh, no, we don't give up. We go there, as you saw in our system, our systems are all wireless devices. I said, go in there, replace an existing wired thermostat using a wireless thermostat. That's all I did. That way, we don't need to do any wiring, any, any um, breaking the wall, putting conduit, none of that is necessary. Let's look at some examples. 
Before I go to the rebuilding data, let me show you the value of our work. Typically, if the data we have collected, we can save the building 20% of electrical demand, 20% energy 20% by controlling and scheduling. I'll give you examples of how we control and schedule. 20% for heating and cooling applications. For lighting applications, even more. The reason is in the US, lights are left on most of the time, even on weekends. So if you do scheduling, we can do 25% or better in terms of energy savings. Good. Now the question is, what are the added benefits of this monitoring protocol? Benefit is, since we are monitoring voltage, current, power, in almost real time, we can, in our case, we monitor every 10, 15 seconds, we monitor this information. Then if you have a rooftop air conditioner, it is drawing more current than normal. What could be the reason for that situation? Maybe the bearing is getting tight. Bearing gets tight, motor draws more current. Or bearing has some dirt. If it's dirt, it has more friction, drawing more current. So that is an early indication of something not right. So what do we do if we watch this? We tell the building engineer, this rooftop unit on building number 13 has been drawing more current for the last few hours. That gives him a warning, something is not right. He comes in, goes roof and see what's going on, fix it. If he did not do that, if this thing ran for multiple days and got worse every day, after a few days, it'll just fail. The shaft will break, motor will be destroyed. That happens. Then what happens? He or she has to go in and order new parts, new motor, new uh, bearing. That may take a week in the US, maybe more in Bangladesh, take a week. So for that whole week, you have no air condition. That is the benefit of our work. Since we give you early warning of the status change, you can take early action. That's one. Second is our focus, my focus is not only energy savings, I want to make the building more healthy more better air quality. So if you work in that building, you are not getting sick by big being in that building or getting tired at the end of the day. What we have done, we monitored the CO2 level, PM 2.5, India's big issue PM 2.5, China also have seen that. We can monitor dust level, we can monitor humidity and make the building more health healthy. Good, now, some examples of buildings we'll show you in the next few slides can tell these are all old buildings, not very huge, nice, shiny steel building, all common building, garage, library, classroom, uh, healthcare center, all of that. So let's look at one building now, building one, Virginia Tech building in Alexandria, Virginia, it is near Washington, DC. Typical building, uh, brick facade, four story tall, building size, square footage, 25,000 square feet, medium, small size building, Monthly energy consumption, here I mean the electricity consumption, 14 to 25 megawatt hour per month, peak load 61 kilowatt. The data for the building. This building was built in 1947, 73 years back, long time back. That's point I'm trying to make. We can go to any old building and fix it. So this is how we go in there. This is an example I'll show you next page. Is one classroom, as an example, we put some hardware. On the upper right hand side, you see a sensor, monitor CO2, noise, temperature, and also humidity. That one box. Below that, you have a box. That's your, that's your, your box that you talked about with the, with the Raspberry Pi inside. That's our core. So that box is monitoring everything in the classroom. Below that box is a plug load controller. Why plug load controller? That classroom has a computer, printer, a Xerox machine, and it also has, it also has uh, a LCD projector. The, the plugged in, always on, never goes off, because nobody has the responsibility to keep the thing off after classes end. Nobody cares. It just stays on. We said no. What we'll do? Put a plug load controller. It will be programmed to go off after 9.30 p.m. and come back tomorrow. That saves a lot of energy. That's one example. On the left side, on the bottom left, motion sensor. That senses if anybody is in the classroom. 
you know, go to the classroom, dim the light, and don't cool it so much, as an example. Above that on the left, I have a thermostat. That shows the building room status, temperature, AC running or not running, fan speed, all of that data. And then on the upper left, we have, of course, the rooftop air conditioner. The reason I show that, we measure the power consumption from that unit so that, as I said in the previous slide, if something goes wrong about more current being drawn, we can give early signal. This is the setup for this class of real world data. Then I'll show you here what data we are collecting. This is a screenshot from my iPad, which is monitoring this classroom and in that building on the lower left. Indoor temperature, humidity, pressure, CO2, noise, all of that. Outdoor temperature, outdoor uh, humidity as well. We know what is our environment. The most interesting part is this blue box on the lower right hand side showing us the change of concentration of CO2 in that classroom as students come in. As your ambient today is 450 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, 450. So it was about 500 in the morning, slowly goes up as people become active in the, in the space. By five o'clock, six o'clock, slowly begins to grow. By 7 p.m. grows faster because class starts at 6.30. This is the classroom, right? This is the room. It's all in, no windows, all enclosed. You go there, you breathe, CO2 level goes up, as you see here. And the class goes on by 9.30 or so that evening. It has reached 1,100 parts per million. Then class ends at 9.30, people go home, and slowly it decreases to ambient 450 by midnight. Let's look at that number, 1,100 parts per million. The healthcare data shows if you are in a classroom or environment where the CO2 level is over 750 parts per million, you feel dizzy, lack of energy, feel uncomfortable. That's what happens in many cases. You go home after a long day of work or taking evening class like this, you tell your family, I had a long day bad day at work. That's why I'm feeling lack of energy and not feeling like doing anything good. It's not bad day at work. It's too much CO2. You didn't know that. So how we solve this problem? We said, fine, as we watch the CO2 concentration, when that concentration exceeds 700 parts per million, we'll throw more fresh air from the ceiling in this classroom. No windows, by the way. As you throw more fresh air, the CO2 dilutes and you are back in a com comfortable, healthy situation. That's how you solve this problem. This is not building automation. No building automation does this. Nobody does this. Some automation systems today monitors this, but nobody controls it. This is our contribution. We can do monitoring, of course, and control, give you solutions. Good. Now, let's see. That was the CO2 issue. Now, the energy issue on this slide. I'm showing you some data. If you look on the upper side of the screen, on the left side, this building, we put six thermostats, all wireless thermostats. I put six power meters. I have to know what's the value of my work. So I'm measuring power before and after. One lithium ion battery for storage and one sensor for CO2, humidity, and noise, and the like. That's the hardware in the building. Then I said, before I deploy my solution, I need to know what's happening as a reference point. So for three months in 2014, we measured the consumption for that floor, power consumption. So you see for three months, the consumption was 8,340 kilowatt hour. Three months, fine, no problem. Then we said, fine, we'll wait. And we deployed the solution, went back, measured for the same three months, which is 6,000 plus kilowatt hour. That means we got a 27% savings of energy by deploying our solution. So we can come back later on, what was the cost, what is the value? So anyway, this is the stuff we put in. Good. Now let's focus on the screen, the middle part of the page. You see between the two gray boxes, the top box says temperature profile before wise building demand reduction, and bottom box says base case, without wise building, base case, both of them. Now look at the data, three lines, blue line, green line, red line. 
Red line is the thermostat set point, 74 degree Fahrenheit or 23.3 degrees C. The set point. That means if it goes above, turn the AC on. Goes below that temperature, turn the AC off. That's it. Fine. The green line shows the temperature profile as the AC runs or doesn't run. If you see from the beginning at 12 noon, AC was off because the blue line is the current draw by the air conditioner. Blue line is very flat, low. That meant AC was not running. AC doesn't run, temperature slowly goes up. We are measuring every 15 minutes. So it goes up step by step. We were measuring every 15 minutes. Then when the temperature reaches about 75 or 24 degrees C, AC comes on. AC comes on, blue line spikes, right? AC stays on for some time. As the temperature drops, AC turns off. Then temperature begins to creep up. AC come back and so on. This goes all day, that's normal. So as a result of normal operation, for that set point 74 degree Fahrenheit, 23.3 degrees centigrade, we got for those four hours, energy usage of 2.72 kilowatt hour. And maximum demand was almost four kilowatts before we put our solution. Then we put our solution and watch what is the difference. We did two things. Why the one to five PM is important? That's the time window when the power company charges more for electricity because of peak demand. That's the issue. That's why we want to stay away from the one to five PM window as much as we can. We also thought if we can pre-cool the building when the electricity power is cheaper before one o'clock, then we would not be able to, we'll be able to withstand keeping the AC off longer. So we pre-cooled the building from 12 noon to 1 p.m. and pre-cooled about 21 degrees or so, pre-cooled for an hour, and then turned the AC off, done off at 1 p.m. Let's watch the temperature rise as the AC was turned off. You can see the green line. AC come, is off. The blue line is flat at the bottom because fan can run, no problem with the fan. Temperature creeps up. I allow it go, to go up to 77 or 25 degrees Celsius. From 23.3, I allow 1.7 degree more. So within the range of comfort zone, let's say. So then we, at 5 p.m., when the temperature reaches 25 degrees Celsius, we turn the AC back on. What's the result? The result is, the energy usage for this action is 1.42 kilowatt hour, as opposed to 2.7 before. The peak demand was almost four before, now it's only 0.5. It's an example of how we can reduce the peak during the high cost hour of the day so that your electric bill is less. So that's the result of our building automation application for both applications, energy and power. We got something for free, CO2 management and control. That's the building option we, we took into account. Second example is another building. We are looking at lighting application here, not energy as much, lighting application. This again, common building is a bus depot, literally bus depot, school bus repair facility. On the upper floor is this office, same building. That office has many functions, of course. The middle picture shows the work area where you put filing cabinet and all that. It's a typical thing. It has a skylight. That's one part of the floor. On the upper right hand side, we have the work area for the staff. They sit there, their cubicles. And then below that is a conference room. I went there about noon time. Nobody is there, so, but lights are on. I asked that question for the work area in the middle. Look, you have good sunlight. Skylight brings a lot of light. Why do you keep the ceiling lights on? Answer was, if we turn the light off, some parts of the floor will be dark, people don't like it. And culturally, if you don't have lights on, they think something is wrong. It's a cultural thing. So we keep it on. We said, fine, you keep it on, but don't keep it on 100% capacity. Dim that. We dimmed it, number one, on this part. Second part on the upper right-hand side, the staff work area, we said during lunch hour, do not need to keep the lights on full capacity, dim them to some percentage. I'll show you how much later on. Below this staff work area is the 
conference room. Conference room, we know when meeting is scheduled in that room. We will turn the lights on full capacity when the meeting happens. Without that, we'll keep the light dimmed. I don't want to turn them off because off means people think something wrong in the room. So keep it slightly lit. With that kind of control and scheduling, look at the numbers at the bottom of the screen. We're saving about a third of the electricity by this control. Look, now the question is more data. This table shows the comparison month to month. If you focus in this table on the middle column, total calculated energy consumption without dimming, normal operation without dimming. 399 in the month of October, kilowatt hour. If you do the, uh, con the control and scheduling, it drops to 264. So 33.8% savings. Month of November, same thing, 423, and dropping 278. Why does the number go up from October, November? Because winter time, as the winter comes in, the days get shorter here. Days get shorter, you can light some longer. That's about it. So this is the way, again, you're seeing about a third, 33, 34% savings. The note at the bottom shows what room was dimmed by how much. Office area, 50%. Office area B, 45%. Chief of offices, desk area, 60%. All those numbers are here. He might ask that question. How do I know these numbers? Good question. The asking is, I did, uh, me, not me, always, my students went in there and watched them for a week, Watch this space for a week. What's going on from eight to five every day? And based on that information, they realize office desk for the uh, chief is like this, conference room is like this, the lunch hour option is like this. Based on that manually, they suggested these numbers. We told the staff in the, on that floor, look, these numbers are not holy numbers, you can change them if you want to. We just give you a starting point. What we did, we said, fine, if this is the number you see, it, we give them the, the uh, UI for the application. Tell them if you think the room, some part or some time is too dark, go back, move a bar, slide a bar, and change the intensity, that's it. And that was easy to do. And they did that and they saved quite a bit. The point is two. One is you have to respect what goes on in the space, number one. Number two, smartly deploy solutions, which does not affect their way of life. And third, give them the power to change things if they need to change. With that, they don't complain. Okay, to the different subject now. We went air conditioning, we went cooling, heating, we did lighting, now rooftop solar. It's my building at Virginia Tech where I work, and this building, I put solar, some solar just to see how this solar output shape compares with the building load shape. That was the idea. Sunny day here, no problem. A example is same building, same roof, also sunny day, but winter time sunny day. Winter time it snows here in Virginia. So if the snow covered solar panel, no output, obviously. But I'm sitting in my office on a lower floor. I look out the window, I see sunny. I then look at the solar panel output is zero. What is it? Be something went wrong? Then I realized it snowed last night. Because of snow coverage, I'm not getting any power or very little power. That's a benefit of our system because looking at the, looking at the uh, current data on a winter day, you'll see whether it is snow covered or not. Then you can do some action to clear the snow or just wait till the midday, snow will melt. This is again screenshot from my iPad where I monitor the rooftop solar activities. You can see the uh, power on the top, DC power, AC power, efficiency for the panel on the upper right hand side, inverter efficiency, total efficiency 14.3%, 0.3%, voltage, DC voltage, AC voltage, DC current, AC current, power, uh, solar radiation, lower left hand side at the bottom, 865 watt per square meter. Uh, we have wind speed, ambient temperature, module temperature, all the data comes in. So how do I know whether I have rooftop solar, rooftop solar covered with snow? You know, ambient temperature 
and module temperature always 10 degree or more difference because the module gets hot. If it's snow cover, it doesn't get hot. I could tell because of the temperature differential was not very high. Now it's what, nine degree, 84 and 93. It's like two degree differential. That means it is not being heated. That means sun, not, sun is not falling on the solar panel. That's the intelligence I'm giving you based on the data that we acquired. Good. Next is battery solution. Battery, the one we put in this building, small battery, five kilowatt, 12 kilowatt hour, and there's a setup in that we put in a garage of this uh, building. Again, this is the screenshot from the iPad where we are monitoring the battery status. So it tells you battery status is active, the uh, current reading, state of charge, Output power, this is not discharging or charging right now. That's so little, zero, one kilowatt, almost noise like this. The point is same platform that I showed you before, which was used for building automation and energy and power control, is also monitoring the solar rooftop PV, also doing battery storage. I can show you the camera. My point is this is the value of open architecture system in air things as you go by. So summary, we believe all buildings should be smart buildings. We've shown that in the, our case. If you look at the screen on your, in front of you, at the bottom is the website, bemcontrols.com. So that company has a lot of data. Go there if you want, I don't have time to give you more than that right now. If you are interested, go to bmcontrol.com website. You'll see this is the landing page. On the upper right-hand side, the green box says, take a tour. You click on that, you'll see video clips of what I showed now. Video clips of building automation, temperature change, dimming of lights, all of that, you'll see that. If you do some experiment, that gives you a starting point for experiments. If you want to know more, write to the company called info, I-N-F-O, at bmcontrol.com, and they'll hopefully respond to your questions. I'll leave it at that for now. So that's the, my technical talk, it's done. Let me take a minute or two to share with you how I see IEEE growing and how much more it can do for all of us. Good. So we are here, well, you are there all over the world. I'm in the US and we're doing this seminar quite effectively. You can ask questions. So we've learned how to collaborate, cooperate and serve as a community you're in Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, India, Japan, Indonesia, Ukraine, all of that. Very nice. This happening. My point is, once the COVID threat is over, we would not forget this experience. We'll keep on as much as possible using the internet, using the video connection to keep working. My appeal to you, the young generation, please don't forget that. That go, don't go back to the old normal new normal, so what will happen? But for that to happen, IEEE has to be broader, like you see here. As more people know how IEEE can benefit, uh, can, they can benefit us as a society, we'll be more interested to work with IEEE. That means we need more volunteer participation globally, like you do very nicely today, in how IEEE is run not governance from the board level. Board is at the top. You have board level, you have society committees, you have society governing board, like PS, like uh, Fatah is a member of the governing board, for example, PES. You have local sections, like in Bangladesh, like I said, Gorakhpur and all that. Let's keep talking among each other. If I become president of IEEE, I would be focusing on that. Communication at all levels and grow together. So finally, one more thing I should point out here. I visit many countries. When I give a talk, come down from the stage, talk to the audience, I see many business cards, especially industry friends. I don't see many senior members. And I've seen the numbers also, like India, Bangladesh, Nepal, of course, uh, many other countries. The number of senior members per capita membership uh, base is much smaller than US and Canada, much smaller. Why is that? because people don't feel motivated to apply to become senior members. I've talked to people, there's two issues. One is you go to apply, go online and fix things. 
and you need the names of three referees who are themselves senior members and better, who can write a letter for you supporting your application. They don't know three senior members. Where do they go? They don't go anywhere, just forget about it. I said, no, what I've done for PAs, I've told many PS chapters, please publish the names of all IEEE senior members and fellows on your website, section website for that matter. Then a young engineer from PDB in Bangladesh, let's say, want to apply for a senior membership. He or she goes to that list and see who are the existing senior members. He may know somebody there already, or she may have her boss know somebody. That way that you break that ice, that whom should I ask? That helps you to be more empowered and be a strong candidate to become a senior member. I would very much like more people like region 10 or region eight, region nine, take advantage of this and do that. If I become president of IEEE, I will make sure this becomes a standard policy, not by request. So keep it that for now. Final slide. Again, I'm running for IEEE president. The reason I show this slide is not for that. The reason is I'm giving you here my email address. I know after I finish talking now, there will be questions about many issues. I'll answer some, but time will run out. Typically this happens. We have some questions unanswered. If you did not get a good answer for your question, please write to me and I'll give you a written answer via email. Again, finally, I see my website is there, esrahman.org. All the talks I've given last two months are published on my website. If you want to know more, Go there, some has video clip even, some all of them have PDF, some video clips. Again, for young generation, I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and also YouTube. You can find me there as well. So I'm easily discoverable and don't mind getting questions from you. That's my last slide. So I'm gonna stop sharing now, get back to Fatah to run the q &A. I don't know who, who will run the Q&A, but I'm gonna stop here for you to take over. So thank you very much for your patient hearing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm looking at the chat box. The first one I see is a question about what are the qualifications required to become a senior member? Very good question. First of all, you have to have five years of experience beyond the bachelor degree, five years experience after bachelor degree. If you have a PhD, that counts for three years. You need two more years. If you're assistant professor, you're pretty much done. That's the criteria, nothing else. Then you go online to apply and you have a box of questions. You fill the box and very detailed. Then you name three individuals who are senior members or fellows themselves. And you need to put their IEEE membership number and their email ID. Then automatically the machine will tell these three people you have been selected by Mr. or Ms. X to write reference letter for you. I get this all the time. Then you click on that box, you meaning the, the um, applicant, and then you, I'll see your data, the, what you put in, your data. And typically when you request a person to be your referee, you send your referee your short bio, so he or she knows what to write, and that's it. And then it goes in, goes to review, and you hear from IEEE in less than two months. You're done. So this is the qualification requirement. Second question is, uh, can you tell us about your IoT security system? Very good question. You know, we are a software company. We mean the company that's working here. And we are very concerned about security breach. So what the company does, they don't use their own network security. They use the devices network. For example, you have a smart thermostat. It is a cloud compatible thermostat. That means the company who made the thermostat has a back channel to get data from your thermostat to their cloud. It's all, it's all done, secure communication. So what this company, the wise building does, it gets permission from you, the owner of the thermostat to contact the cloud library of the provider's software. So they're talking to the cloud, not the thermostat directly, to the, their cloud. That means if something goes wrong along the way, it is protected by the company's 
data security system, not the IoT that device we produced. That's how we solve this problem. We're lo looking at the cloud access point for the company using the credentials you have used as your as the as the building owner to do this. That's the solution to that issue. Then the question is, uh, I said, oh, thank you. Hold on a second. Um, yeah. Is there any privacy issues involved with smart building concept? If there is any, how do you manage to tackle these issues? Again, the privacy issue is there. That's why I said, if you remember this picture I showed you, campus picture, many buildings, then the building manager for the campus can see every building, that's true. If it is a community of homes, you can see that. So you must trust somebody because you have to make sure your building manager is not watching what you do every, watching not with the eyes, with the electrical demand, what goes on. So that privacy issue has to be settled somehow. Otherwise, you don't have somebody watching over your power consumption. Again, as I said in my talk, I focus more on commercial buildings, not residential buildings. The reason is this privacy issue. If residential building, I have in my house, same system, but I'm the manager. So I, nobody else looks at it, I look at it. But I am an engineer, I have built it. I, don't, I, I can feel comfortable. You are not an engineer in many cases, what do you do? Either give that option to somebody to manage it for you or you manage it directly with the provider. That's my answer. Second question is, uh, somebody said, please send me your PPT on my email ID. I gave my PDF file yesterday to uh, Satyaki. So you can publish it if you like. I have no problem with that. And then they can download from your website. That way you can make them visit your website also. No problem. Thank you, sir. Uh, Another question is, sir, about uh, how the demand would come down in your system. Uh, right. It's telling almost one fourth of what it was. Correct, correct. I say about 25% or so, you're right. Right. So I, these are numbers that is not I mean, this, the measurement, not just made it measure, measure data for my buildings. So that's, and you can do better if you are more restrictive in terms of when you will start the building lighting, maybe you start at 7, we start 6.30 in this case. You start a little bit later and come back, uh, finish quicker than 9.30 p.m., like my case, you can do better. So that's, that's good. I see a very interesting data from somebody, uh, I mean, Satyaki did that. You have like <laughs> India, Odisha, Assam, Karnataka, Gorakhpur, Kerala, UP, Haryana, Bang Bangalore, West Bengal, Hyderabad, then Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, Ukraine, Taiwan, Nepal, Uruguay, Lebanon, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, China, Pakistan, Japan, Philippines. Very impressive. So you should put that on your website to see how <laughs> good it was and then people want to see my talk go ahead you will be able to uh, share with them I, you're recording this talk i noticed that i have no problem if you publish a recording as well you publish it so then they can hear your voice in addition to mine and celia's voice as well and yeah. of course Sheikh Patan. thank you sir uh, one said one, one thing a question here from well, they ask one question uh, like communication between IoT devices. So in your slides, you have mentioned about the communication uh, between IoT devices. Can you describe the number, different number of ways to communicate between IoT devices? Communication between IoT devices. Correct. So that uh, he is asking. Like, uh, let me go back in one second. I'm another question from. Uh, from somebody else talking about slide number 13. It is not clear how the demand would come down. Good question by almost one fourth with wise building. When the energy I can see because you are not running the AC, energy goes down, I get that. A very good question, I should have taken more time there. What's happening here, Orlando, 
is as I turn the AC off, AC has two components, compressor and the fan. Compressor is a bigger energy consuming part of any air conditioning, fan is less. So what I did in that case, the AC was about three or four kilowatt capacity, compressor capacity, fan maybe 300 watts. As I turn the compressor off, that's why I go from four kilowatt to 0.5. The 0.5 was used for keeping the fan on. That's the reduction of kilowatt, not kilowatt hour. And then you run it for four hours at lower capacity, you save energy. That's the answer to that question. Another question from Shailendra, how is continuous dimming done on lamps and what would be the impact of that on the life cycle of lamps? No, nothing. Why? This example I gave you is using LED light. LED lights are designed to be dimmable. When you buy LED, there are two kinds. One is dimmable or non-dimmable. By non-dimmable, it's a problem of the life. Dimmable is designed because LED is not a filament, right? It's not a CFL. LED is an electronic device. It is like a chip, literally a chip. The LED is, I mean, I've never seen LED lights, it's just a chip. It's all solid state. Nothing, no issue of heat and, and all that. So LED light is the example I gave you and you can dim all the time, no issue on the life cycle. Uh, I talked about senior member issue already. Uh, talked about security system. Uh, one more thing before I go on. Uh, okay, can you tell us more about Modbus communication system? Uh, good, Modbus is widely used for building automation today. Is wired system, Modbus. So what we did, if we have a Modbus meter, I put a converter. The Modbus signal, which is analog, converts to IP, then becomes Wi-Fi. That's why when I see the, my box, which is Raspberry Pi, it sees Wi-Fi coming out of a Modbus device because I put a converter in between. That's what I managed to do. Uh, second is, last question, I think, uh, Jesus uh, Guzman. Is there an open platform or any resource that you can recommend for teaching IoT courses, especially for online teaching as recently required? Depends on what you're teaching. Uh, if you go to the internet, I mean, Google, let's say, and put in a word score, say, online teaching of something. So I did for my grandkids school, show them how does a solar panel work. So I got that from some other source online that how in common language, we can explain how solar panel works. So that's, that's how I'll do that. So that's the last question. Hold on, hold on, hold on a second. Just another uh, question about reliability. Reliability issues. Good question. I have been doing this for more than five years now. Typically, a thermostat lasts for 10 years at least, 10 years, thermostat life, typically, even the warranty for one year. Other devices like smart plug, smart switch have used, they have not failed yet. So I'm assuming they are okay. But I would suggest anything can fail. If you go to a building, especially in a remote area, I would suggest you keep some of the extra device with the building engineer. Make two extra plugs, it cost you maybe 34 plugs, no problem. Thermostat is more expensive, but they last a long time. So I wouldn't worry about, I know people that are in remote areas get concerned if thing breaks down, what do I do? So if, when we do deployment, like we've done in other countries, China, we keep one extra thermostat, one extra plug load controller there as part of the contract. So uh, video recording will be available, I guess. Uh, Sri Lanka, I'll talk to Sri Lanka people on Thursday, two days from now, so you can look more there. And uh, that's it. I don't know if you have any other questions, uh, Fata.